Welcome to Deepen with Pastor Joby Martin. The Church of 1122 is a movement for all people to discover and deepen a relationship with Jesus Christ. And we're praying this message helps you deepen your relationship with Him. Now let's dive in. All right. Welcome back to the Deepen Podcast. We're joined once again by the Reverend Dr. Pastor Charles Martin. (laughs) New York Times bestselling author and corner toter. Uh, of course, Pastor Joby, welcome. Uh, why don't you tell us about your hat? Oh, yeah. What is it, X-29? It is. Yeah. The reason I wore it is because we are a part of the X-29 network of churches, which is great. We weren't a part of any denomination or anything when we first started, so I thought, I need some kind of some help, accountability, some mm-hmm. stuff. And so, it's great. It's uh, The reason I'm wearing it is because we got a big conference coming up. And I'm preaching it, which I'm super honored to do. Mm -hmm. Uh, And a big part of the reason I'm honored to do that is because two of my favorite preachers on the planet I get to share the stage with. We're not preaching at the same time, thank goodness. And hopefully I go before them, I guess. I don't know which which is worse. But anyway, Matt Chandler's preaching it, Dr. John Piper. Mm -hmm. So Matt's like a—he's just kind of a dude, buddy of mine now, which is kind of a weird Mm -hmm. thing. I was super fan a bunch of years ago. And now uh, we were texting today about some stuff. And um, I will tell you this, all the Matt Chandler fans out there, as good a preacher he is, as he is, he's a better dude, mm. which is a cool thing to get to know. You know, like just as a dad and as a husband and as a friend, he's just, mm-hmm. a, he's just a great dude. And I get to preach with Dr. John Piper. So this is open to, you don't have to be an Acts 29 church. Any mm-hmm. church can sign up. Anybody could sign up, I guess, and come be a part of it. I think it's called the Next Conference. Yes, Next Conference. It's April 15th through 17th in Dallas, Texas. So uh, if you're listening or watching, you can go to acts29.com slash next and register. And uh, Deepin Podcast listeners can get $20 off with the discount code Deepin. Really? That's so cool. Uh, Oh, yes. We are so official. (laughs) Yeah. We got ourselves you can a catch that in the show notes. <laughs> That's what everybody says. Show notes. Oh yeah, I but mean, there's also some breakouts too. Like mm-hmm. uh, Pastor Britt and I are leading one. I know. I know. Mm-hmm. Uh, Pastor Adam Flint is mm-hmm. leading a breakout. So it, yeah, it, you should be there. Yeah, three of my favorite pastors. Four. Okay, four. Well, Britt Britt counts as one. <laughs> but yeah, Pastor Britt tonight. Pastor, He's in Alaska serving a church mm. preaching a men's conference it's minus four degrees yeah we uh i don't see him doing well in the cold no. <laughs> before we started recording we debated on whether or not we should just talk about alaska and this is a dire podcast oh, yeah. uh, i would have very little to say but. charles and i are planning a trip <laughs> for the future to alaska yes we pray will. for the right dates uh, oh yes mm, amen amen well join us for the next conference it's going to be awesome all right we're in week three of this series to tell us die and Let's start off this way, Pastor Joby, which is a question that you asked. Was Jesus forsaken? Did, does God forsake? Uh, he was more than forsaken. He was crushed, and the Father was pleased to crush him so that we could be reconciled unto God. Hmm. But the idea, the way it has always been explained to me, I think— may sort of be technically true, but I think it implies a bunch of things that aren't right and true about mm-hmm. God. <clears throat> so the way I, it was explained to me kind of growing up was God can't look at sin, so he turned his back on Jesus. Mm-hmm. But, but it's not, an, he is actively pouring out his wrath stored up from the mm-hmm. beginning of humanity mm-hmm. unto Jesus who became sin on the cross. Because what I don't want to ever imply is that, well, I sinned. Does God turn his back on me? Mm -hmm. No, because Jesus was punished. Mm -hmm. So because Jesus was forsaken, I never will be. Mm -hmm. So when Jesus says in Matthew 28, I will never leave you or forsake you. Mm -hmm. So we just want to be clear about that. Mm -hmm. And in Psalm 22, what he quotes, it says, no, 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 no. His face was upon him. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't think you can take that phrase... Uh, alone in and of itself. Mm -hmm. You have to understand that Jesus was doing this rabbinical uh, level of hermeneutic called a remez, which means hint, and he wants us to, he wants his listeners there 
to go through all of Psalm 22 and say, all of this is happening in your presence. Mm -hmm. There's a song that has a line that says, the father turns his face away. And I remember that being a somewhat controversial line. Yeah. Um, Maybe it has something to do with him being God. You know, that God, because he is God, Jesus is God, and taking sin upon himself, and God cannot be, have sin in himself. You know what I mean? And so then when he looks at you and your sin, it's because you're not God. And maybe that's maybe that's part of the difference. But I think most of it was fulfilled prophecy. Yeah. It said it was gonna get dark, it got dark. Hmm. You know. I was talking to somebody today about <clears throat> Psalm twenty two, and at least what it tells us is that there is a there is a darkness that you feel that is so deep that it it feels that God has forsaken you. Like, and then when he says in verse three, yet you are holy, you're enthroned in the praises of Israel and you are fathers trusted. So that is, could you say that's a normative experience for the Christian? Well, you see it all throughout the Psalms where it starts in despair and Mm -hmm. ends in praise. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, that that happens in, Mm -hmm. you know, in almost all the Psalms of ascent, like Mm -hmm. you start real low and you end real high. I mean, Mm -hmm. that's kind of what it means, Mm -hmm. but... So, yeah, I mean, the cross is the perfect picture of what do you do when it feels like God is not answering your prayers, when he's far from you? Yeah. Because while we only talked about this in light of being a messianic prophetic psalm, Mm -hmm. I think David's just sitting down doing his quiet time, Mm -hmm. and he feels like God has forsaken him. Mm -hmm. So there's a thousand years before this ever makes any sense in Mm -hmm. light of God's redemptive plan. Mm-hmm. So, which I do think it's a legitimate feeling that we have yeah. that sometimes we feel forsaken, like, God, what are you doing? And God doesn't rebuke David. He'd be like, how dare you ask me that? Mm-hmm. There's some, uh, my friend of mine, another pastor friend of mine that I like, a guy named Brian Tolm in Ohio, <clears throat> he was talking about, um, he was talking about the Psalms and how these are great prayers to pray. Hmm. Um, like personally and individually. What makes a great prayer is that you just cast it on the Lord. Hmm. It's not even good theology. Mm-hmm. It's not even, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It's not something that you would necessarily say, hey, why don't we just wallow in this for a little while, the forsakenness feeling. But what we see in the Psalms is God inviting us to just like, he was saying God is a safe space for you to spew all your junk. Mm-hmm see the Psalms. He gave a bunch of examples, like bash the children of my enemies' heads against the rocks. (laughs) Is that a good prayer? Maybe not like during elder-led prayer Mm -hmm. corporately, but you know, in your your own private Mm -hmm. space, yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. Cast all your cares upon him. I was reading a book recently about prayer and one of, it was like, what if you're asking yourself, like, what if I don't know exactly how to do it right? And I don't remember what the quote, who the quote, what quote was from. But it was like, if you're praying, you're already doing it right. Right. You know, uh, Charles, what do you, what would you say to somebody who is experiencing that kind of darkness where they would say something like, why have you forsaken me? Well, another translation is, my God, my God, why have you rejected me? Mm. So that's, a, that's another way maybe that, maybe that puts some, makes it easier for folks. So sometimes the word forsaken you know, it, it rattles around, but mm-hmm. I know rejection. Mm-hmm. The way I've looked at it is... Jesus and the Father, from eternity past until this moment on the cross, knew perfect unity. Mm -hmm. They were never not in perfect communion and unity with one another. Never. Mm. Now, Jesus is our high priest, and he can empathize with us because he too has suffered everything that we have suffered. What kind of king would he be if he'd never known rejection because then all of us who have been rejected at any point in our life, from birth to us to the grave, how can he empathize with us if he's never known rejection? So in my way of thinking, and I talk, I talk about this either in what was true, they turn the world upside down. This is when God the Father, how however he did it, whether he looked away, and I don't know, I, I tend to think God can look at sin. I don't, I, I just think he can, but that's just me. Whatever he did in that moment, Jesus knew something he had never known. Mm. And it was crushing to him on a level that I don't think he had ever been crushed. And I think 
Rejection is the deepest wound of the, of the human soul. And I say that because it is the last thing that Jesus suffered on the cross. Mm-hmm. So when we, we see this a lot when, when we pray with folks. They're, the, you know, this, the, the, the father wound, the, the wound of rejection, the, mm-hmm. the kid who was you know, dropped on the doorstep and you know, nobody ever, whatever. Yeah. This, that, that wound is really, really deep. And it takes the Holy Spirit in, you know, to get in there and root it out and heal it. So when I look at this and I see this, I see God the Father allowing Jesus to experience something he's never experienced, which then allows Jesus to empathize with us who have ever been forsaken or rejected. Mm. Yeah, I mean, maybe that's what makes the devil the devil because he experienced ultimate rejection. I mean, he tried to sit on God's throne and was ultimately and eternally rejected. All right, so here's what we know that he is, what is happening. So you always want to be a little bit careful when you're like, okay, the sky turned dark, therefore that might mean, you know what I mean? There's a bunch Mm. of things. But if you just read Isaiah 52 and 53, you know that he's despised, you know that he's rejected. I mean, it says it right there in verse 3, so that was a good get there, Charles. You know? Thanks. So like you can always use the Bible to interpret the Bible. Yep. So we know that the suffering servant verses in Isaiah 52 and 53, the, the ones we're most familiar with are in 53. So all of these verbs, he is receiving that. He's despised, he's rejected, um, he's bearing or borne our griefs, he's carrying our sorrows, he's stricken, he's smitten by God, he's afflicted, he's pierced, he's crushed. Like you could just... Well, all of those things, that is what's happening mm-hmm. when he quotes Psalm 22. Yeah. All of those things are mm-hmm. happening actively against him. Now, I know you just said, be careful with this, but what what is your opinion on the darkness, like the three hours of darkness? I have a very non-theological answer to that. I would love to hear it. The light of the world is being identified with sin. Yeah. Mm. He made him who knew no <clears throat> sin to, to be. become sin wow. so that we might become the righteousness of God. Mm. So there's a transfer and an exchange happening in that moment in my way of thinking. Mm. The light of the world is identifying with and becoming sin. It's like, in, in my way of thinking, it's like starting to wrap itself around his DNA. Wow. And we, in that moment, are offered righteousness. Mm. Revelation 21 22, I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine in it, for the glory of God gives its light, and its lamp is the Lamb. Yeah, he is light. I mean, even even in Genesis, when he speaks light into existence, there's still no source of it. Mm. Like, it's it's the fourth day before you get sun and moon and stars. Mm. So where's the light come from? Because he said light. Mm. I saw, remember Far Side? Remember those things? Yeah. Being ourselves? I saw one, it was like, in the beginning was nothing, and God said, let there be light. And there was still nothing, but at least you could see it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, in him was life, and that life was the light of men. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming to the world. You ever think about, you don't have life in yourself? Correct. Even listen, man. The sun, I have a biology degree, and that and a bus ticket will give you a ride on a bus. So Doc, Mar- Doc Martin, <laughs> dude, the way that things are alive, the scientific community is just baffled by it. Mm-hmm. You know, they're like, we don't know. Yeah, but if it gets a little, if you don't have this and that, it doesn't mm-hmm. work anymore, and you can't plug it back in and make it turn back on. Mm-hmm. Like if the blood leaks out of something, it dies. You can't just add the blood back and it just catches back on. Mm -hmm. There's like this spark of life that, I mean, we can measure it. We know how to turn it off. Nobody can turn it on. Mm. We can resuscitate, but you can't turn. Sometimes. Yeah, sometimes. Sometimes. Mm. You leak all the air out of you, you don't have life anymore. You Mm. can't wait three weeks and just add more air back in. It's not like a battery that you can recharge. Mm -hmm. It is this miraculous, supernatural, non-reproducible event. And if you read Bible verses, it explains it all. I love it when you when you tell and you've told it a hundred times, and I, I love it when you do it. But the the God the Father crafting, taking the dust, 
yeah. and you know molding this dust into what you and I see in the mirror with nose and eyebrows and you know my way of thinking he t- t- does the little dust thing and makes like an oblong thing mm-hmm. and sticks it in the socket and covers it with a lid I mean you, you know he's we're his creation it's perfect and so he he has made us perfectly in his eyes but we're still not alive right. we're just dust and what can the dust do? Nothing. Right. Dust can't make itself alive. That's right. Dust can't do squat. So then God fills up his lungs, breathes into us the ruach of God. Thank you. And we become living, breathing souls. But we didn't do any of that. That's right. When we were dead, he made us alive. And not, every time I read that, I'm thinking about the whole making mud pies thing. Me too. We didn't do any of it. Nothing. And we, we can't were, take credit for any of it. Man, have y'all ever seen, I've talked about this before, uh, there's a documentary called My Life as a Turkey. So good. <laughs> it's this Auburn grad that raises wild turkey eggs, and as they are hatching, he sticks his face down there because there's this thing in bird nature called imprinting, and whatever the first thing they come face-to-face with, that's mama. And he's down there, like, face-to-face with these little turkeys, wild turkeys, bro, pecking out of the eggs. And he's like, just making little turkey putts, and and he's super good at it. But he's from Auburn. What else is he going to do? And so, (laughs) dude, these freaking turkeys think that's their mama. Mm -hmm. And they are wild turkeys. And they follow that joker around in the woods for almost a year. And then, I mean, you just want, you like, the gospel implications are just, and if you're a turkey hunter, it's the coolest thing ever. Hunter Brandt told me about it. Mm-hmm. So then, and then, if you just kind of want to keep going with the story of the scriptures, so they're following them around, and, like, two of the ten of this little flock are males. They're called jakes, the little boys. At first, you can't tell the difference. You know, they all kind of look the same. Mm-hmm. And then the jakes, the males, their heads start turning real red, and they've got this little tiny little beard starting to pop out. And then sure enough, they get to the place where they think they're old enough and they know better, and they attack him, Mm -hmm. and he has to abandon them. Wow. They attack their mama, mama, papa, who served him, you know, who kept them alive and did all the things, Mm -hmm. because they're like, forget you, we got this, Mm -hmm. sure enough. Wow. That'll, that'll, That'll preach. It totally will. And it makes me think, you know, going going back to the the light going, the sun going out, the sun going dark. Have you ever heard speaking to Doctor Piper? He has so many parts of of sermons where he talks about the the sovereignty of Jesus being the one who's like, because of his command, the oxygen molecules in front of your face are available for you to breathe. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And. So that is the level at which this is the king over all creation, that when he's under this duress, the sun's like, boom. Yeah, so Dr. Piper is... um, So one of the things people have told me, like just today in the lobby, that they like about my preaching is I can take things and make them very accessible and put them on the bottom shelf so even the kindergartners can get it. Mm. Dr. Piper does the opposite. He (laughs) is the smartest guy you've ever heard of. Mm. And... He just preaches the biggest God sermons he can possibly get his brilliant mind to talk about. Mm-hmm. And it just makes you... One time we're sitting on the beach, and I I hardly ever listen to music. <clears throat> I just listen to preaching and podcasts and things like that. And we're sitting on the beach, and I can just... Apparently, my face is kind of, you know, I'm just like a possum, man, just grinning. And Gretchen's like, what are you listening to? And I was like, Dr. John Piper. <laughs> She goes, what is he talking about? And I say, I have no idea. (laughs) I can't even, I was like, I have no idea, but I feel like I just love the Lord so much more right now Mm -hmm. as I'm sitting out here on his beach. Mm. That's what he does, man. Mm. He just has the the biggest God theology you could possibly Mm. fathom, and he keeps trying to stretch it every every sermon. Mm. Well, you said uh, a lot about the cross and this word excruciating and um I, i've been reading this i've been reading this book about talking to non-christians about about faith and it made me think about how many things in our world are marked by this this man this jesus including like what year it is mm-hmm. and <laughs> right. words like passion or excruciating you know like so much of so much of 
what happened in Jesus' life and death and resurrection are everywhere, even if you don't see the significance of it. Maybe is that why you wanted to write 40 Days About the Cross, Charles? No, I think, well, I, maybe, but I, I, sometimes I don't, I don't know the entirety or the enormity of why the Lord puts something on my heart the way that he does. I just knew that I, I wanted to get quiet with the Lord and ask him to reveal himself to me in a way that maybe he hadn't, or I hadn't been listening. Mm. And so when I really, I mean, I, I think we've talked about that. I, I know I've told you about standing over the hole and I'm like, will you show me? And he said, like, yeah, just walk back to my cross and I'll show you. So mm. for me, it was a, a a process of sitting down primarily with the gospel of John, but you see the others in there as well, where I'm just walking back through the events in his life with an eye toward the cross. And I'm asking him, what does this mean mm. for me? Like, I'm not even trying to write the thing for you all. Mm-hmm. That's too big. I can't handle mm. that. I'm just trying to write it for me. Mm. So it became a, it became a pilgrimage on my own that, I then felt like the Lord said, why don't you lock arms with some of your brothers and bring them back to the cross? Pastor Joby, why do you think in Matthew, the text you're preaching tonight, it gives us the Aramaic and then the translation into English? Apparently Jesus said it in Aramaic. So do you think that was added? Like that's the Bible translators are saying that? Like, here, let me, let me give it to you in both both ways? Um, you know, it's hard to get at it. Like when I ask our, our tour guides in Israel, let's just say they're a little extra pro Israel. So they want everything to be in Hebrew. Mm -hmm. Um, there are some people that believe that like first century people that grew up in Galilee would be speaking a lot of Aramaic Mm -hmm. and that they could go back and forth between Hebrew and Aramaic. Mm. I don't, I mean, how do you know? I don't, I don't. I am a big believer, and I just believe what it says. So it says, he said, Eloi, Eloi, lama shabachthani. So I'm going to go with that. Hmm. Here's something that's I noticed uh, reading this recently. Verse 47, some of the bystanders hearing it said, this man's calling Elijah. Yep. And I think I was reading in Luke, maybe. Yep. And it said, wait, wait, let's see if Elijah does come. That's right. That's crazy. <laughs> well, not really. So the last verse of the Old Testament mm-hmm. in Malachi, right. the last thing they hear is, Behold, and I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes, and he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. Mm. Then the next page in your Bible is mine says the New Testament, you could write 400 years mm-hmm. of blank. You yeah. get nothing. You get a bunch of stuff happen historically, but then God doesn't really say anything. Then <clears throat> Luke starts with the fulfillment of this prophecy, but they missed it because they were looking for him in the wrong spot. And John the Baptist is coming, and it is prophesied over him and he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. Mm. So, I mean, a lot of the gospels is the story of the people that knew their Bibles the best Mm. and missed it every single time. Mm -hmm. They missed, they were so focused it was like the tradition of man. We talk about this, right? The tradition of man nullifies the word of God. What a Mark cr- seven. what a crazy verse. Mm. So you can get we any one of us. They did this. They get so locked into the tradition of man, mm. what somebody told them these verses mean, that they missed the act the actuality of the verses, mm. the promise fulfilled in their midst. I mean, I say it all the time, but. I mean, the Pharisees, man, they're three feet away from God incarnate. They could smell the breath of God, and they're not filled with the breath of God because they missed him because the tradition of man nullified the word of God. They didn't realize it. We were talking a few minutes ago about how you see some things sometimes in Scripture, and you're like, how did I have never seen that before? <clears throat> and I remember reading that exact thing about John the Baptist being like, that's what it is, you know? <laughs> because And... 
every good Jewish boy was focused on the Messiah coming, right? Totally. And so, because what they thought it meant was political, yeah, national deliverance. So what they did, if you go back to Isaiah, and we all have a tendency to do this. This is why you got to be really, really careful with the end times guys that got it all figured out. Because the major mistake, I think, that the Jewish religious leaders in the first century made, they read themselves into the story so much mm-hmm. that they could they weren't open for God to do it the way God was going to mm-hmm. do it. Yeah. So they got re- they missed out on all the suffering servant stuff. Mm-hmm. Like, how do you miss this? I was talking to a guy in the lobby tonight, and he grew up Jewish. And he was, he was a great guy. And he's funny. He was like, I've been coming here for like eight weeks, and now I'm kind of Jewish. That's what he said. And I was like, you said that, and it's awesome. And so I said, what are you going to do with Jesus? <clears throat> and then I say to him, dude, Psalm 22, this is your scriptures. Isaiah mm. 53, these are your scriptures. Right. Mm. But they missed all those. So they jumped to all the prophecies that we believe will be fulfilled in his second coming, not his first, like lions laying down with lambs and flowers sprouting in the desert. Because they read themselves, they're like, what do I get out of this? Hmm. And that's where they went. So be really, really careful when you read yourself into the text when you are the beneficiary of the promises in the temporary. Hmm. And they missed him. And the disciples actually asked him about that. Uh He said, why do the scriptures say Elijah must come first? And what's he say? Elijah does come first. That's right. But they didn't didn't recognize him. Yeah, he's like, yeah, he was here. Remember the locust eating guy? And speaking of Isaiah, you know, you just said they're reading, they're reading so much themselves into this. It's not like it wasn't there. It was there when Moses said it and Isaiah said it. Isaiah 49, it is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to bring back the preserved of Israel. I will make you as a light for the nations that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. Yeah, so when Jesus is... It starts with the Sermon on the Mount. One of, the, in my opinion, one of the most misunderstood texts in all the Bible, because people cruise by the Beatitudes like it's a list of, like a code of conduct or a value system. It's not. It's the gospel, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. So then he gets to the implications of the gospel, and he's just preaching his version of that. Mm-hmm. It's like, who lights a lamp and covers it? The salt of the earth if it loses its saltiness. What good is it? You are a city on a hill. Mm-hmm. He's just giving commentary to all these prophecies from Isaiah. Mm-hmm. Like this ain't just about you. God wants to work through you. I don't remember. Did you say this last week, or did I hear it somewhere else that if it was good, every <laughs> everything there's 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 mirrors of what's hap- what happens in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Mm-hmm. And so I also think that in the Sermon on the Mount, it's a mirror of Moses on the mountain saying, sure. "Hey, this is what the people of God are to be." But just like the Ten Commandments are misunderstood, right? It says, I will be your God. I have saved you and you know, stretched out my hand and saved you with a mighty hand. Now, therefore, do this. And right. then you have the Ten Commandments. People might read the Ten Commandments and think, well, it's just all rules and you're earning your way. No, no. Did you read the first, the first thing? Mm-hmm. You know, yeah, he didn't that. send them the Ten Commandments in Egypt and then give them a midterm and be like, congratulations, you've got a 75 Correct. and C is equal degrees. Therefore, here comes the plagues. Yes. That, that are... Identity precedes activity mm. that he saves us first, and then we act like it. Mm. Uh, and you you mentioned this a, a couple of times, Pastor Joe, which was really really good. Tweetable, if you still do, people still tweet. Xable, what do you say? What do you say? It's not called Twitter anymore. I don't know. I don't. I've never sent a, <laughs> a tweet. <laughs> I evidently uh, have a. What do you call it? A Twitter. A tweeter. Account? I've been told I have one. I have no idea. I've never <laughs> sent a tweet in my life. Same. Okay, the, sorry. The execution. Actually, if I do, we need to have an intervention. Yeah, I have people. <laughs> My people have I remember the first time I ever saying. heard about it. Yeah. Ryan Stone, this is a long time ago. He's like, hey, man, check out my Twitter. I'm like, I'll fire you. What are, you, what are we talking about here? <laughs> He's like, oh, it's going to be big with the kids. I was like, oh, okay, boy. yeah, good. Uh, the execution of God's son is the execution of God's plan for the salvation of God's people. And I believe that's a shout out to JP, JP. Martin. I shouldn't have time to get into it. So, yeah, yeah. man. So, uh, he was a, seven years ago, he's 11 years old, and one, I think Pastor Britt had the idea, I think, we did this thing 24 hours of preaching, 
And we just stood in this church and preached for 24 hours. And I took all the good times because I can't. So I had like the 7 to 8 slot and then like the 7 a.m. slot, whatever. So I had the good times. And all the interns and everybody had to like... Oh, I had like 3 a.m. What did you have? It was bad. It was was like two people there. Yeah. It was for the Lord, though. Well, but you're, you know, now you're the boss of everybody. So you probably could have got a better spot. Anywho. (laughs) Well, we streamed it and my family just kept it on Mm. nonstop. We did too. Yeah. It was awesome, right? Yeah. I mean, you like wake up in the middle of the night. There's just be like, hey, there's John Barringer preaching the word. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, yeah. So JP's eleven. I get home from my slot, and he's got his youth Bible, and he had like three different Bibles out. And I was like, "What are you doing?" He's like, "I'm writing a sermon." I, I think he thought, you know, maybe I got to get ready because <laughs> yeah. I get called <laughs> up. You never know. <laughs> and what he was doing, to his credit, and our really our kids ministry and student ministry's credit. I was like, what are you doing, buddy? And he's like, well, he's like, I'm trying to figure out how to say that, that like Jesus, this was God's plan from the very beginning, you know? And so he knew about what we call the proto evangelion and, you know, the serpent crusher idea and mm-hmm. the temples, all that kind of stuff. So, so straight up. So we worked on it a little bit and then he wrote it down. The execution of God's son was the execution of God's plan. Mm. And then what's really cool is, Later that year, we had a hurricane, canceled church on Sunday. And I was like, all right, buddy, you're up, your sermon. And so he got it out, and Reagan's like, what am I going to do? So she was our worship leader, you know, mm-hmm. and she did her little dances and mm-hmm. kids' songs. We, me, me and Gretchen sat on the couch, and he got all his Bibles up there, you know, yeah. and he read through. It took about good, about six minutes, so he doesn't yeah. take after his dad. But <laughs> it was awesome, though. Uh, Wasn't it awesome? Nice. That is it, though. You know what's crazy is there's some progressive Christians, which there's actually no such thing, mm. that's called a lost person mm. or an apostate. Mm. But uh, they will say that this whole idea of penal substitutionary atonement is uh, divine child abuse. What a what a twisting and misunderstanding mm. of the good news of mm. God's saving grace because mm. he is the just and the justifier. Yes, And so... Mm. Nobody took Jesus' life. He laid it laid down, down. Yeah. as a ransom for us. Hmm. So He volunteered for it. Volunteered for the abuse. Correct. That's the case. And this is where the Trinity gets real. I mean, they're one, man. They're one. Like, God died that God might endure the wrath of God to prevent God's children from receiving the wrath of God. Mm-hmm. Just use that. Like, don't use the mm-hmm. Trinity names. Just use... Mm-hmm. That name, and it all is true. Mm-hmm. Charles, would you explain the Trinity real quick? <laughs> <laughs> Can I give you this? Is this is going back? This is like eight in the mid eighties, and I this did a thing for me. I, I'm this, I'm sure this is this is totally not theolo- theological at all. But one of my one of the guys I listened to when I was a kid was Mike Warnke, oh, the comedian. Yeah, and, and, and I know. There was a lot about his story later, but for me, he ministered to me as a kid a lot. Like that man had an impact mm. on me. His life did. Mm. And because he made the gospel something I could relate to, but he had an illustration, which is he said, I believe the Trinity is kind of like a cherry pie. He said, on the top, you got this crust and you can cut it into three slices and you, you, you can see the delineation of the three things. But underneath, you got this cherry gooey stuff that no matter how you cut it, it's still the same stuff. And if you get it out on the plate, you kind of just kind of flip it. So that's, I'm, I know that's not all that theological, but there you have it. It's one of the few now that stands up the longest mm. before you get into heresy of like modalism or partialism uh-huh. or you know some of the yeah heresies. this is what I know about the Trinity God through the Father God the, God the Father through the Spirit raised the Son to life that's right and when I look at what happens in the life and and when I, when I look at the gospel mm. it is as if the Father the Son and the Spirit are in a healthy competition to bring glory to the Father mm. however that works. They they don't want to get left out. Whatever the Son does, He glorifies the Father. Whenever the Father does something, He sends the Spirit. Mm-hmm. Jesus gets back to heaven, sends the Spirit. Mm-hmm. There's a there's a sweet love for and with and in one another yeah. that I don't under, pretend to understand, but they are all there. Which is, by the way, the heresy of Unitarianism is to deny the Trinity. Correct. So that I would say that there's not three persons, just one. I believe it's Jehovah's Witnesses are so 
Yeah, they do turn. That. But they believe they don't believe in the divinity of Christ. Correct. They believe right. that he earned it over time. Right, right, right. So you really dig deep and start getting your own planets and stuff, and they're like, "Well, we don't believe that." I was like, "Have you read your your <laughs> documents? Because it says you do. They just don't talk about it very much." Mm. What's the significance of the time periods? Now, you talked a lot about time periods. Seven hundred years prior to Jesus's life, right? Uh, David the, writes this a thousand years before Jesus lives. Mm-hmm. He says things like. And my hands and feet will be pierced. Mm-hmm. That's three hundred years before the Persians invent crucifixion, and then that's a few hundred years before the Romans show up and and perfect it. Mm-hmm. I mean, this is unbelievable. Except it's it happened. Mm. Didn't you also say that Psalm twenty two is one that is not read by? Jewish people, dude, you, you you stand in Israel today and say, "Well, let's just look at Psalm twenty-two and Isaiah fifty-three, and they'll be like, we're not allowed to read that. That's poison." Mm. Oh wow, well. mm. that's what the, that's what the dude in front of Hezekiah's tunnel told me. And like that, the Jewish guys talked to you tonight. He he was like, "I just can't understand how he's a he's about to be a pro golfer." I hope he listens to this. He'll know what I'm talking about. Mm. And uh, I was putting it on him, man. I was like, there's a, there's a dividing line today. You got to decide right now. He didn't decide, but whatever. Um, <clears throat> and he was like, I just don't understand how God can be God, but Jesus can also be God, but not. And I was like, that's like trying to, I was like, you're never going to understand that. It's like trying to explain a, your golf sw- swing to a cricket. And he was like, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's just the first thing that came to mind. I mean, of mm-hmm. if it was all explainable in a way we could get our head around it, how could the English language even sufficiently describe hmm. the creator of all things? Like, it's just, you're just not there. When um, you, you, you had a conversation tonight with somebody and you told them, you're just not going to understand it. I had a conversation tonight with somebody. And I, I, that was one of the things I said, you're not going to understand it. Here's how Peter, this is John 6, the end of John 6, hmm. when... One of my, I mean, I, I, this scripture hurts, but in John 6, 66, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. So this is a dividing line where there are those who follow and those who don't. Jesus says, you want to leave? And Peter says this, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And then look at his process. Look what he says about his process. We have believed and have come to know that you're the Holy One. Belief came before knowledge. Preach. Belief came before understanding. That's right. So he mm-hmm. chose to believe, and then the Holy Spirit made it real. Mm. We like to flip that around because mm. we want to control the outcome. Mm. We want to understand. We want to under- know all the facts. We want to have all the information. And then if it makes sense to us, then mm. we'll choose to believe. Mm. Jesus never, that, that was never his prescription. I think the whole story of sanctification is that. Mm. I mean, I'm at camp. I don't know Jack. And I get mm-hmm. saved. Mm-hmm. And the whole rest of my life mm-hmm. is growing in knowledge and depth of insight mm-hmm. of what I believed when I asked Jesus to come into my heart. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's it. That's the whole, I mean, it's what I'm doing. Like you say, you write for you. Dude, I preach these sermons to me, man. I just need to hear about the cross again to me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and because I've trusted him, and another way to say it is because I've tasted and seen, mm-hmm. like I've personally mm-hmm. experienced his goodness. Mm-hmm. In light of that, there's a whole lot of other things that make a lot more sense. And the things that don't, what do you do? When I? Because here's the thing. Peter says that because Jesus starts talking about, you got to eat, eat my flesh and drink my blood. And he's like, ugh. You know, and I've said it a million times. We're not even supposed to eat a pig. How are we going to eat a prophet? Like, mm-hmm. we can't do this. So what he and Jesus could have explained it. He could have been like, ah, it's cross communion, don't worry about it. Mm-hmm. He doesn't. So what do you do when you don't know? You pick up your doubts and you just keep following him. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And over time, like one day, even if on, on the other side of eternity, we will know in full. Mm-hmm. So whatever questions we have about this, that, and the other, and you know, all the things that Christians like to fight about, we're like we're gonna step into the presence of God. We're going to see clearly. And God's going to be glorified in it. Mm. And the only way I know to explain it is like, ah, oh, there you go again. Ah, mm. oh, I should have known. I think I'll, one of the things we were talking about, you mentioned it, 
when God, when I'm reading a passage and I see something I've never seen before, like the first time I ever connected all of Psalm 22 with this, mm-hmm. I was like sitting in a tree stand. I'm like, oh, God, you're so good to me. But when I read something in Charles's book, like that there were seven bloodlettings of Jesus and I mean, seven bloodlettings in the Day of Atonement back in the Old Testament and then Jesus, there's seven different instances where he sheds blood. I'm like, oh, you dummy. How did I miss this forever? <laughs> but whatever those things are, yeah. imagine the, you step into heaven and now we see dimly, man, mm-hmm. like a fuzzy mirror that like you can barely see through the glass, kind of. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, crystal clear and we, know in full and are known in full. And we're like, so that's how you received glory in mm-hmm. all the atrocities of this world. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's how you did it. It makes me think- And of, we'll be cheering him on. Yeah. Since we just landed in John 6, can I, can I derail you a second? <clears throat> because you said something early in this podcast, talking about the Pharisees, not, you know, it's the traditions of men that make the word of God of no effect, or another translation says, makes it null and void. Well, here's Jesus in John 6. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. Okay, they're, they have no box for this. They're, they're probably grossed out, but they also, they also have Leviticus screaming at them because... Jesus is now telling them to do something that he doesn't explain. Mm -hmm. Eat my flesh and drink my blood. Well, in in the law in Leviticus, somewhere around 17 in the middle... It, it's written, the life of the flesh is in the blood, for I've given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls. And then about six verses later, the life of every creature is its blood. Its blood is its life. So the Lord is making a connection for the people... At this time, mm-hmm. 1,500 years before Jesus, mm-hmm. he is telling them, don't identify with the life of that thing. I want you to hold off on that because there's going to come a moment when I'm going to want you to identify with the life and I can't have you identified with something else. So then when Jesus, in my opinion, when Jesus says this in John 6, they don't know how to take it and he doesn't explain it. And he only sort of partially explains it to his friends at the Last Supper in about 10, I don't know, eight, eight more chapters from this moment. And he says, when you do this, you do it in remembrance of me. He's not, he's not, telling, he's not telling them to cannibalize him and eat his, take a chunk out of his thigh. But he's, he's making an identification for them in this moment that the Pharisees don't know how to accept because they've got Leviticus 17 screaming at him. And the reason I bring all of this up is because you heard, you've heard me say this. I, I know enough of the word to be a really hypocritical Pharisee. And I, I had this thought this week, if I was in the crowd, as much as I know and love Jesus, and he had said this to me, and I know the word from Leviticus, how do I respond? Do I say what Peter says? We have we believed and come to know? Mm. I, I don't know. I, I would like to think. I would like, you know, whatever, but, you know, I'd like to think that the Lord would do a thing in me and I would believe, but this one, this one hit me this week with the Pharisees did not, the Pharisees couldn't take it because the law is screaming in their ears and Jesus, the law giver is standing in front of them saying, I want you to identify with my life. Mm-hmm. You asked me something, you asked me something last week talking about the blood and, and, and so I'm going to derail you again. I'm going to take like 10 seconds to tell this, but you asked me last week about the blood and praying for people and how we, how sometimes when I'll, I'll pray, I'll pray the warm red living blood over people and, and, and myself. And then we talked about the reasons for that. So if you missed that, go back and listen to last week. But I didn't explain where I first drew that picture. Mm. And where I first draw that picture is with the nation of, well, currently they're just slaves. They're not, they're not even a nation yet, but they're in Egypt. So they get to the last plague mm. and God tells them, sacrifice a lamb, then take a bunch of hyssop, which was basically just a shrub. It kind of makes a pretty good paintbrush and paint the door of your house. And for everyone who takes the blood of the, sacrifices the lamb, catches it in a basin and then takes the hyssop and paints the door, I will pass over. The spirit of death will pass over and I'll spare your son. Okay, so 
What struck me about that is you could go through all the steps. You could tell your family, you could sacrifice the lamb, you could catch the blood in a basin, but the blood in the basin is useless if you don't paint your house. Hmm. So I just, it's a, it's, a, it's, it's me in recognition that the life of the flesh is in the blood and he's given it to us upon the altar to make atonement for our souls. No, I'm not actually dipping my fingers in blood, but I am recognizing and identifying with its life, mm-hmm. with his life in it. That's where it came from. And it's also a, an extension of that reality that it's not like the gospel is not just for our initial salvation or something that like oh, the blood of Jesus that washed all my sins away and that was kind of, it's contained over here in this neat little thing. Like you talk a lot in your, in, the, in it is finished about how it is ongoing, perfect, present, perpetually being finished. Like it's finished and, and on, and so it takes that ongoing nature of the blood. Yeah. You know what I mean? So the illustration that I use tonight that we're using actually in the Grace Train book, but I just couldn't, it's too so good. good. This guy named George Wilson, 1829, yeah. robs the mail, which it doesn't even, ex- when you look at the story, it doesn't, like, how do you, why do you rob the mail? Anyway, they rob the mail. It does mail. not say, and our editor, so when you read the book and you ask this question, our editor asked us this question also, and we researched it. We it's like fi- in the Library of Congress. Right. Like, you know? We could not figure out anymore. They just robbed the mail. So they get 10 years in prison for the robbery, but they put a gun to the man's head and said, if you don't do what we say, we kill you. They got death sentence for that. Hmm. So... Word gets out. I guess the guards or somebody get to know Mr. Wilson, and he's repentant, and he didn't want to do it, and he felt he was co- coerced by this other guy. Whatever. The president gives him a pardon, so he shows back in court. He's like, "Congratulations, you've been pardoned." He didn't say a word because he's like, "I did it. I'm. I need to pay for this." He goes all the way to the Supreme Court. Is a pardon a pardon upon the giving it or receiving it? And the words of the court were, a pardon is not effective until it is received. Hmm. And when I saw that, I was like, the blood is not effective until it is received or applied. Mm -hmm. The pardon is not effective until it is received. Hmm. Same thing. Hmm. In fact, if you really want to get into it, for whatever reason, I've been into this all these people ask me about, do I believe in limited atonement? You know, like when Christ died on the cross, who did it count for? I'm like, well, listen, man, the, it's just what all the people get hung up with on Calvinism. It, don't try to make it something that it doesn't say. Atonement just means payment. When Jesus died on the cross, who did that count for? Everybody? Mm-hmm. Is, is everybody going to heaven? Mm-hmm. Only people that believe. Believe. So by definition, if one person in all of human history didn't believe, then it is limited. Correct. The only payment was made for people that believe. That's all that means. That's right. So you either believe that or you're a universalist that thinks, like Rob Bell, everybody's going to make it because mm-hmm. love wins. I think love won at the cross, but you have to believe in order for it to be applied. The pardon is ineffective unless it's accepted. Mm. And Rich. the heart of God in that moment is that all should come to the knowledge of him. That's it. And that none should perish. And he's made and the way. All and none Still mean, I mean, I, I'm not a Greek scholar, like, but they still mean all and none. Right. Mm. Uh, <clears throat> we're in Matthew 27. After Jesus cries out and yields the spirit, behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. <laughs> And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. So I think me, you, and Britt are sitting at the spot in the Mount of Olives where they build a big teardrop church where Jesus yep. apparently cried and said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, that I would gather you like a sheep. I mean, like a chicks under my wings. You know what I mean? And, you know, there are all those current graves there. They weren't there in the first century. It was a different set of graves. Mm-hmm. But we were like, I've always wondered, what? Okay, so what? What? I mean, it's like a thriller video. You know what I mean? They're like, da 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 da. They're everywhere. Yeah. And the spirit's like, no, 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 no. Just wrong one. Wrong resurrection. It's the second. It's when he returns. We're all getting up. Uh huh. But they did, man. The power was like so powerful. Yeah. It resurrected a bunch of people. It's like Paul says, the first, the first fruits from the dead. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. 
Going back to Exodus. By the way, the bars in the tabernacle, what kind of wood were they made out of? Acacia. Acacia wood. Uh, you shall make a veil of blue and purple and scarlet yarns, fine twined linen. It shall be made with cherubim, skillfully worked into it. Here's another thing. When Adam and Eve are thrown out of the garden, there's an angel or cherubim that guards the entrance of the garden. The veil to the holy place of the tabernacle had an angel on it as well. Mm. Um, you shall hang it on four pillars of acacia overlaid with gold, hooks of gold. Uh, and the veil shall separate you, for you, the holy place from the most holy. And then you put the mercy seat and the ark of the testimony in the most holy place. What's, there's so much in that, in that verse. Why, why say the veil was torn from top to bottom? I think it's an invitation. I do too. I think bottom to top is like, look what we did to get in here. Top to bottom is like, there's only one up at the top, and it's God Almighty, and it's his invitation. I mean, I say it all the time. The the thing that separated the presence of God from the people of God has been torn apart, and we are invited. I mean, Hebrews talks about this in the coolest way. Mm -hmm. Like with boldness as children, we get to walk into the presence of the king and make our requests. Right. Um. Because this this holy of holies was it represented the throne room of God on the earth, and He would be present there annually because the blood of the Lamb was covered the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant. So the broken laws of God were covered over by this sacrifice. Well, Jesus, the angel says about Jesus, and John the Baptist says about Jesus, He wasn't going to cover our sins; He's going to take them away. So now there is no separation from the presence of God and the people of God because our great high priest has gone before us and made the sacrifice, which was himself. Mm. Do you have any idea how thick the curtain was? Oh, it's stupid thing. It's not like one of these things. No, it's not a curtain. Um, from my understanding, it's like four to eight <laughs> inches thick yeah. or was. And it, it's not like you and I can just walk up and bicep it and tear it. There's, I mean, you'd have to string two trucks together and pull on it. It's, mm. it's, a, so it's thick. Like, it also mm -hmm. sounds like God and Rick James have the same interior decorating <laughs> taste. Everything's like gold and purple. You know what I mean? <laughs> Ooh, there must have been there must have been people in there at the time though who would have yeah. said it tore from the top. Because doesn't every gospel include that detail? It tore from top to bottom. There is also I, I get asked this question sometimes, like these private conversations. How do, how did John know? Mm -hmm. Jesus did come back. Yeah. For six weeks and hang out with him. Mm -hmm. And he totally could have been like, hey, John, you're going to need to jot this down. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. Remember that woman they brought in the adultery? Here's what I said. You know when I doodled on the ground and everybody left and I just leaned mm -hmm. over and I whispered something to her? Here's yeah. what I said. Yeah. Who condemns you? You know what I mean? I mean, there there was like a, it doesn't all, it can per, be explained in the natural, post-supernatural mm -hmm. of Jesus being resurrected. Yeah. And the gospels are less like, journals of like the guy's experience as he's walking around like, hey, look what Jesus just did. And more like they interviewed a ton of people, I'm sure, and compiled and organized all this information and put it together. So it was, yeah, it was collected by Matthew, but he re he relied on a bunch of different sources. So Especially when you, if you put all four together, it's like the complete box set. Right. I mean, so Matthew's there and a tax collector, and writing primarily to a Jewish audience, but it's a ton of eyewitnessing. Mm -hmm. John is there, also an eyewitness, but way later in life, and it's almost as if, I mean, the reason I think his isn't synoptic is I think it's like late in life, and he's like, let me cover all the stuff theologically that nece hadn't necessarily been covered. So I'm not going to start with like Bethlehem and angels. I'm going to start in the beginning was the word, like this, the theological idea of what happened. And then Luke wasn't there until the middle of Acts when he shows up, starts riding around with Paul. <clears throat> and so he writes to a guy named Theophilus, which means God lover, which this rich guy is like, hey, man, we need to jot this stuff down. And he interviews everybody. He says it himself, mm -hmm. and he's a doctor. So, like, he's this is like a, you know, like a journalist trying to make sure he gets all the details. And then Mark most likely interviewed Peter, right. which was like, the, you know, except for John, the guy closest to him. Mm -hmm. Well, you couldn't make up a better panel 
of getting all the angles and all the eyewitnesses and all the stories and all the events. Mm -hmm. You couldn't make that up. If you were, like if you were a church father commissioning the group of people that ought to write these accounts, Mm -hmm. you you couldn't get a more holistic viewpoint Mm -hmm. than that. Mm -hmm. You mentioned, Pastor Joby, the the centurion, verse 54 of Matthew 27, when the centurion and those who were with him keeping watch over Jesus saw the earthquake saw the earthquake and what took place. They were filled with awe and said, truly this was the son of God. Do you think this was his coming to faith moment? I do. It wasn't just an observation. This must have been the son of God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think, I mean, yeah, I think that that is his confession. Mm-hmm. But based on the evidence that he has seen. Mm-hmm. You know, history uh, calls this guy Saint Longinus and... Says that he went on to be a leader in the church, Catholic tradition. Your 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 church history Dude, knowledge he, just blows me away. Hey, listen, I did, I did some research. I just got to look at this cheat sheet. I, <laughs> I didn't do I didn't do the quiz question this time. So. Thank you. Well, we're talking next week about Jesus's words, "Mother, behold your son." And so, in the end of this passage, it says there are many women there looking on from a distance who followed Jesus. And uh, what's the significance? Maybe it's a preview for next week. What's the significance of, of mentioning them and mentioning where they were? Well, there's a couple of things. One is, um, I don't mean to, to demean these women. They're incredible. But they're, they, because they are women, are not going to get chased down and persecuted like the men are. Mm. When they weren't seen as a threat, like they were going to try to fight back. Correct, correct. And um, so on the negative end, the women could not like, they couldn't give a statement in court. They couldn't vote. They couldn't own land, you know, that kind of thing. But the benefit of that is too, yeah, they're not a they're not a state threat. Therefore, they don't have to, they can walk around way more freely and be identified with Jesus than say, the other male disciples because as goes the leader, so goes the team. And he might come and get us. They might come and get us. Okay. Mm-hmm. So the other thing, Charles mentioned this last week, but it's very true. A lot of commentators and theologians will say part of the reason the women are standing so far away is because Jesus would be stripped n- n- to near nothing or maybe nothing. And just out of, I mean, nobody wants to see that. And so the women would stay far back, but apparently Mary ventures up close enough to where there's virtually a conversation. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, no problem for mom to come cruising up. Mm-hmm. But but this is, I mean, these are some of the, I don't know how you read the Bible and not see that this had to actually happen. Mm-hmm. Who could think about all those little details to get them all right? This mm-hmm. is what led C.S. Lewis to Christ. Mm-hmm. It's the detail. I mean, when Tolkien says, you know, Lewis is teaching uh, medieval mythology, and and Tolkien says to him, "But what if the this myth is true? He doesn't mean myth like a made up story. He just means like a you know this story. This what it, it's true." Hmm. And Lewis begins to compare what he has a PhD in with the details of the scripture, and he's like, "Wait a minute, hmm. there's too many details. 153 fish. In the story of Beowulf. It's just like." And a monster came and they killed him. Like, there's no like, you know, there's no details like that. So that's it. I think I think the women, it just is an alignment with first century culture. If what all the other things are being described are true, mm-hmm. it's also uh, for me. It's also an indication that they their intent was to shame him. Mm. So if he's naked. They, they, in their minds, have shamed him. The women would have stood at a distance, which takes me back to what we talked about earlier. Because he's known shame, we get to take him ours. Because he's known rejection, we get to go fall on his face and cry out and plead with him to heal our wound of rejection or our t- whatever it might be. But because Jesus has known those things deeper than anyone ever, mm. he alone is able to minister to those places in us. You know, you wrecked all the dudes last week when you talked about how crippling shame is, particularly to men. And so we're on a little, like, friend, family group text. It's just all the people that live on our street that are 
as close as blood. The closer because it's the blood of Jesus. I mean, seriously. Mm. And so Rebecca Maxwell, who is also a longtime guest here and a brilliant person, she was just commenting on the shame stuff that Charles brought up. And then, I, so I start going down that road. So why is it? Why is shame so crippling to men? And I think because we got this fundamental question deep in our soul, do I have what it takes? The gospel says, no, you don't, but I've done this in your place. Mm -hmm. We have a tendency to say, I'll show you. Even mm -hmm. Christians, like me and you, we want to, we we keep falling into this. I got this. I'm the man. I'm the protector. I'm the provider, you know. Mm -hmm. The cross turns this thing all the way upside down. And then Paul identifies with this in Corinthians when he says, in my weakness, you are strong. So the bravest, strongest thing a man can do who say is listening to this or their disciple group listens to this is to bring into the open the things that you are most ashamed of and watch the gospel light of Jesus just burn it all away. Mm. And you'll be the strongest son of a gun mm. in your group because the devil has no hold on you. Mm. Death has lost its sting. This is what resurrected living is like. We started off with, well, you know, the, the saying, if you, if you look at the seven sayings, this saying is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's the beginning of Psalm 22. And Psalm 22 ends with, he has done it. Like the generations will say he has done it or it is accomplished. And another translation of it is finished is it is accomplished. It's the same. It's Sorry, the same. Come on, man. It's you can't make that up. <laughs> uh, so, Pastor Jebby, why don't you wrap us up here with, um, I don't know, maybe whatever thoughts you have, obviously, but for the person who is in the my God, why be forsaken me? To g And this might be just the prayer, you know, but to get to, it is finished. He has done it. Um. So a thing, like can't read yourself too much into the story, obviously, right? right? It's all about the glory of God. The death of Jesus on the cross was the glory of God. God is glorified when people get saved. This accomplishes it. You're not the point. I can't reiterate that enough. And yet simultaneously, what is also just as true, without making too much of ourself, posterity shall serve him. It shall be told of the Lord to the coming generations they shall come and proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn. Hmm. I do not think it is a long shot that while before Jesus pushed up on his nail pierced feet and says, It is finished, he knew that it counted for the three of us right here. Yeah. Hmm. We weren't born yet. We are the posterity it's talking about. Hmm. We are a part of the all nations that this message is going to go to. Hmm. We can see part of what's evidenced with his conversation with his mom mm. is he can simultaneously be paying for the sins of the entire world, redeeming the whole world, fulfilling all of the promises and prophecies of the Scripture, and at the same time have somebody else in mind and take care of their needs, namely our salvation. That's why it's not about how you're feeling or how you're doing. It's about what he's done. Because it didn't happen when you were even alive, like you said tonight. Dude, I love that. That one song we've been singing I don't know what you're doing. I don't know what you're doing, but I know what you've done. That Jesus on the cross knows, like the person that feels, here's, here's what, so it happens a lot in the Psalms, right? So it goes from, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's how I feel right now, mm -hmm. David would say, Jesus mm -hmm. is on the cross. You just got to keep going, man. You just got to mm -hmm. keep going through the gospel, keep going through the gospel, and you're going to get to the place where... Mm -hmm. Wait a minute, you haven't forsaken me. You're literally down on the cross right now for me mm -hmm. and know it because you're telling me it's for me. Mm -hmm. That's not forsaken. Mm. Amen. Let's pray. Good and gracious Heavenly Father, God, I thank you, I thank you so much for these friends. Um, thank you for your word. Mm. Oh my gosh, your word. Mm. That we would be born in such a time where we got like, I mean, it's just in my hands right now. People mm -hmm. died to be able to even get a copy of it, and I've got so many. Mm -hmm. i got one in my pocket and all the translations. God, I thank you that you kept your word. You inspired your word. God, yes, you I, please continue to open our minds to 
like understand your word. Mm-hmm. That Psalm 53, I mean, Psalm 22 and Isaiah 53 and Matthew 27 all have the same author, and it's you. It's about you. It's for you. And God, thank you that we would be the posterity that serves you and that we were told of the Lord and that it is finished and that counted for us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for listening to the podcast. (laughs) The end.